What is the scariest story you know that is 100% true? Story 1. Was working the evening shift at a gas station. Man comes in all disoriented. I go to help him out. He has a gash on his head and doesn't know where he is. I couldn't see any crashes around, so assumed he had fallen or something. Normally, we are supposed to stay inside the glass shielded register area whenever someone is in the store. I, being a nice human being, went to help while calling the police slash EMS. They got there and checked him out. They thought his head may have been fractured. Took him to the ER. I went back to work. Cops stopped back by for some coffee a few hours later. They told me the guy got hit by a baseball bat trying to break into a little girl's bedroom and he was wanted for R word and murder in two other states. I never left the register area at night again. Because no one else has said it, I just wanted to briefly thank you for putting yourself out there to help that man. You couldn't have possibly known what was going on and there are countless other reasons someone could have shown up in that kind of state. You did the best thing you could based on the information you had at the time and that's admirable. Additionally, you helped get him to the right people who were able to keep him alive and in one place until the police arrived, which means he got to face additional repercussions for his actions. I consider that a plus, personally. Basically, no matter how you look at it, you did something that had a positive effect, even if it didn't turn out to be in the way you'd expect. I wanted to make sure you got some kind of thanks or acknowledgement for it. I worked at a retirement home for people who were old and mentally absent. There was a guy whose head was severely caved in and he was a racist old a-hole. Every once in a while, he would get in the fetal position and start screaming and sobbing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. I'm sorry. Please help me someone, please. Someone please help. When I asked, it turned out he was a serial pedophile and had R-worded countless children, some younger than five years old. When he was finally caught and thrown in prison, the prisoners beat him to within a centimeter of his life and caved his head in. He suffered extensive brain damage and now he has to relive that prison beatdown several times a day, every day for the rest of his life. And when he is lucid, he can't even control his bowels or feed himself or even walk. He had to relive his trauma much like his victims have to relive their trauma. Story 2 the Lake Nyos disaster. The lake periodically belches a cloud of invisible carbon dioxide gas that suffocates everything within a 16 mile radius. In 1986, over 1,700 people and all of their livestock died without even understanding what was happening to them. My science teacher in high school was in the Peace Corps and one of the first people to come across this village after it happened. He said it was so eerie because all the flies and mosquitoes had died and it was so silent. The story from a survivor is crazy. I could not speak. I became unconscious. I could not open my mouth because then I smelled something terrible. I heard my daughter snoring in a terrible way, very abnormal. When crossing to my daughter's bed, I collapsed and fell. I was there till 9 o'clock in the morning on Friday until a friend of mine came and knocked at my door. I was surprised to see that my trousers were red, had some stains like honey. I saw some starchy mess on my body. My arms had some wounds. I didn't really know how I got these wounds. I opened the door. I wanted to speak, my breath would not come out. My daughter was already dead. I went into my daughter's bed thinking that she was still sleeping. I slept until it was 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon on Friday. Then I managed to go over to my neighbor's houses. They were all dead. I decided to leave because most of my family was in Wum. I got my motorcycle. A friend whose father had died left with me for Wum. As I rode through Nios, I didn't see any sign of any living thing. I was unable to walk, even talk. My body was completely completely weak. Okay, I'm never visiting a deep lake again. Thanks for that. Story 3. The story of Mary Vincent always stands out to me. In 1978, 15-year-old Mary was hitchhiking. A man named Lawrence Singleton picked her up. He brutally R-worded her and eventually made her get out of the car. She planned to run, but he noticed and cut both of her arms off. He threw her into a ditch or ravine and left her to die. She packed her stumps with mud to stop the bleeding and spent all night crawling out. She eventually made it to the highway and starts walking, naked and covered in blood. The first car that saw her sped away in fear. The second car was a couple on their honeymoon. They picked her up and she survived. The part of this story that messed me up was when she tried to run, he grabbed her by the arm and turned and hacked her with a hatchet. She said she watched as her dismembered arm clung to his forearm as he separated it. When he was paroled after eight and a half years, any town they wanted to place him in stood up and revolted against it. He had to live in a trailer on San Quentin's property throughout his parole. At the time, the long 
longest sentence he could get for R word and torture was 14 to 15 years. Thanks to Mary Vincent, California passed the Singleton Bill, where these types of crimes can be sentenced to 25 years to life. I remember her episode on the show I Survived, and I was astounded that this actually happened. After watching it, I did my research on her with my mother, and we uncovered more of the gruesome details she left out in the show. During her trial, she was a total badass. She referred to Singleton as my attacker and testified against him twice. Singleton came out and said, I'll finish the job if it takes me the rest of my life. He only served eight years, but upon release, parts of California didn't want him living in their area. He had a hard time in settling into society, obviously, and ended up saying that he was the victim in all of this and tried to sue Vincent. Obviously, that failed, and the courts dropped him, for lack of better terminology. Vincent, however, got married, divorced, and had two sons, and is now an artist. This is really a rough summary of everything, but yeah, super interesting story. Story 4. John List killed his whole family, wife, mother, daughter, and two sons. He meticulously planned the whole thing, canceling all delivery services, excusing the kids from school, and even turning the air conditioning as low as possible to preserve the bodies for as long as possible. After he killed them all, he placed the bodies in sleeping bags and lined them up. He then wrote a letter to his pastor explaining why he had to kill them. He then leaves and isn't heard from again. 18 years later, he's remarried and doing the same job as before, but this time he doesn't have any children. He's finally arrested after a tip was given to the FBI. Crazy thing is that because he planned it so well, the bodies weren't discovered until a month after the murders, so he had a huge head start and essentially started a new life in the same career and was heavily involved in a new church down in Virginia. It took 18 years to capture him. He pretty much explained that he killed his family to ensure their entry into heaven because he was worried that they were straying from their faith, so in a way, he thought he was saving their souls. Fun fact, his original family home, the one where he murdered his family and left their corpses to rot, had a previously unnoticed original Tiffany stained glass window worth around $500,000. He cited financial strain and not wanting his family if he was broke as a part of the reason for murdering them. Whoopsie. The tip came in when old neighbors of his in his new life saw a sculpted recreation of him as he would look like then because the last picture of him was 18 years prior. The sculptor worked with a criminal profiler and pictures of John's parents to work out how he would look. If you want to learn more about it, there is a really good episode of Forensic Files that covers it. I remember that. The forensic artist picked a pair of really dorky glasses for the model. For some reason, they just looked right, as if the man the model represented would wear these boring middle-aged man glasses. Based on his psych profile, he was arrested wearing the exact same frames. Story 5 in my town in the early 90s, there was a notorious killer that had all of BC, Canada on watch. My wife's mother, years and years before I knew them, had been home alone while her husband was in England doing tree surgeon work. Arborist. She was in her laundry room when a man walked up from her basement, completely scaring her. She freaked out and said, what the hell are you doing here? He said he was friends with her husband and was just coming to see if he was there. Apparently he told him he could just walk in, which she knew was BS. She was smart enough to tell him that he was just at the store and would be back any minute. He said he would wait outside for him. As soon as he left, she called the police, but he was long gone by the time they got there. Two weeks later, the killer was caught. His mugshot was put on TV and it was the guy in her house. The guy's name was Terry Driver. My family has a similar story and I'm pretty sure some of you serial killer buffs out there might figure out who it is before the reveal because their story is pretty unique. When my parents were in college, they went on a trip down to Florida. They had met through mutual friends and were down there together but hadn't gone on a date yet. My dad and one of his friends were planning to meet my mom and some of her friends at a hotel, but being the carefree college guys they were, they lost track of time and realized it was impossible to get to the hotel on time by walking. They decided the best solution to their problem was to hitchhike, and a car with two women picked him up. Everything seemed fine until the driver asked them if it was okay to stop for gas. My dad and his friend agreed it was no problem, since they were having a good time and she drove into a gas station. She then pumped her car full of gas before hopping back in and flooring it, basically stealing the gas with two hitchhikers in the back. My dad and his friend were beginning to freak out when she pulled a gun from under her seat and asked, are we gonna have a problem? Or something like that. My dad and his friend shook their heads, vehemently, because what else would you do in that situation? She then drove 
drove them to the hotel and dropped them off without so much as a scratch, and they kind of thought nothing of it until the news started reporting on a serial killer in Florida known as Aileen Warnos. He took one look at her picture and instantly recognized her as the driver. The only reason my dad thinks she didn't straight up kill them was because they were super polite and respectful to her and her victims were usually scumbag guys trying to take advantage of her. To summarize it, Eileen Warnos is the reason my dad got to his first date with mom on time. My great aunt knew the person I think you're talking about. He was good friends with her son, and he had come over for dinner one night. After he had left, my great aunt told her son that she didn't like him and said that he didn't feel right. A few months later, he was caught after a woman saw him watching her outside of her house in our small town where everyone knows everyone, and she was eventually questioned by the police about him. No one in my family knew about this until a few months ago when she finally told us after we were talking about him. So scary. Crazy how many killers you might just know. Story 6 my dad and some friends got drunk and went for a drive on some back roads and were going as fast as the truck would go as teenagers. My dad was slightly less drunk than the others and eventually demanded they let him get out. They pulled over and he and one other girl got out. He and the girl started walking to town while the other three sped off in the opposite direction. While less than a mile up the road from where they got out is an extremely sharp turn which they missed and hit a tree going pretty close to triple digits miles per hour. Two of them died on impact and the only reason the third survived is because they crashed in front of a house that two doctors lived in. The survivor was paralyzed and lost his leg and part of his arm and was in the hospital for eight months before dying. This was in the 60s, so medical care wasn't what it is today. When I first got my permit, my dad took me to that corner to explain the importance of safe driving. It gave me goosebumps about how close he was to being in the truck. He said that the dad of the driver got what remained of the truck to be hung up in the center of town for months after to be a warning to all. That's terrifying. I missed a situation like this years ago. We were hanging out with a buddy at the bars and we left to go back to his place for some smoke and video games. His roommate comes home from work. He was a bartender and tells us he's heading out to the bars and asks if we want to go. He'll drive. We go back and forth but eventually decide to stay in. Turns out the buddy had been drinking heavily at work, but we couldn't tell. He ended up flipping his Jeep off an overpass and dropping 20 plus feet. The entire back of his Jeep, where I would have been sitting, was crushed into the the back of the front seat. The roll bar was smashed into the passenger side. Buddy ended up getting some serious brain injuries and spent the next few years learning how to walk and talk again. He's still pretty off and much different than he used to be. My other buddy and I came very close to a similar or worse fate. Some kids in my town that we kinda knew, old sports teammates of my brother, were goofing off on backcountry dirt roads, hood surfing. Details are unclear, but they were either trying to stand on the hood of the truck as it moved, or had detached the hood from another vehicle and were actually towing it behind and trying to stand on it. Anyway, they got into a collision with another car, hurting the surfer very badly in the middle of nowhere. The grown men in the other car said they would go and get help, but never returned. Turns out they were in trouble with the law on unrelated matters and just left the kid to die, which he did. Driving safely is something a lot of people hear and don't really think of twice about, but it's so damn important. Important. Don't try to be cool or just have fun. Story 7 this is a hometown story that stayed with me. It happened literally right around the corner from where I grew up, maybe a two-minute drive away. Judy Kirby murdered six children and one adult by intentionally driving the wrong way on a divided highway in an attempt to commit suicide. She had been hospitalized for depression, but had also just ended a relationship with her ex-husband's brother and was, by some reports, involved in drug trafficking and fearing an imminent arrest. She picked up her sister's son, who was celebrating his 10th birthday that day. She then then loaded her three children into the car, supposedly to pick up a gift for the nephew. Instead, she went missing with the carload of kids. A short time later, calls started coming in to 911 about a car going the wrong way down the highway at a rate of speed. They made it about 90 seconds before a head-on collision with another vehicle, driven by a father with two children and another child along for the ride. The crash annihilated both vehicles. The only survivors were Kirby herself and the child who was along for the ride in the other car. There were pieces of children all over the highway. She was sentenced to 215 years in prison. A similar thing happened with someone my boyfriend knew. Got wasted, started driving and ended up colliding head-on with an ambulance on the highway. 
anyway. I'm pretty sure there was no one in the ambulance besides the driver and he lived. I don't really mess with alcohol because of things like this. It seriously annihilates your inhibitions, so much that you don't process how freaking idiotic what you're doing is. But alcohol makes the government a shit ton of money, so of course they're just going to sweep it under the rug and keep pushing the public perception that it's not one of the most dangerous substances known to man. Same thing happened to a girl I went to high school with. She was nine months pregnant, traveling home from a doctor's appointment with her fiancé when a madman attempting suicide flew from the opposite side of the interstate, across the median and straight into their lane. Unfortunately, the speed at which his truck was traveling turned it into a projectile that went straight through their windshield and they were killed instantly. And of course, that monster who decided to try and take someone else with him in his suicide attempt survived. Makes me sick when I think about it. Story 8 Years ago, when I was eight, my family lived in this big weird house kind of on the edge of a small town. The school district was in the middle of a big restructuring, so even though we were only a couple of grades apart, my brother and I went to different schools and took different buses. This left me as the last person to leave in the morning and the first person to get home in the afternoon, which meant it was my job to make sure all the lights were off and the door was locked. One morning, I noticed the basement door was open and the light was on, so before I left, I turned off the light and closed the door. When I got home, home that afternoon, the light was on and the door was open again. I just assumed that I'd forgotten to actually take care of it when I noticed it in the morning, so I went over to turn the light off and close the door. When I got to the top of the basement stairs, I looked, and there was a big shadowy male figure towards the bottom of the staircase. I freaked out, slammed the door, and pushed a bunch of boxes against it, and then went and hid in my closet. For months, I didn't tell my family because I was positive that what I had seen was a ghost and didn't think anyone would believe me. Then, about a year after that incident, my mom and her boyfriend realized that small amounts of money had been going missing for months, totaling around $800 to $900, but never more than $60 at once. So we all walked around the house with flashlights trying to figure out how they could have gotten in. Turns out some creep was climbing in through a small hole in the outside of their house, shimmying through a crawl space and then coming up into the house through the basement. Realizing I had been alone in the house with him on at least one occasion was one of the worst, most terrifying moments I've ever had. Damn, I hope you weren't too traumatized. When I was 16, a big group of us were going to a Texas Rangers baseball game. It was so much fun and we all got very drunk. One of my two best friends, asked his dad if he could go, but his dad said no because he had to watch his two little brothers until his dad got home. He argued with his dad, basically, Dad, they'll be fine for two hours until you get home. Connor is 12, it'll be fine, and his dad finally gave in. Then my friend got a call from his brother, Connor, while we were at the game, and he said that when he got home, he went upstairs and saw a man in their youngest brother's room going through his stuff. He said he froze and then bolted out of the house before the guy noticed him. Luckily, no one was hurt, and weirdly, nothing of value was stolen. To me, it's weird that this guy went upstairs first, instead of to the master bedroom or bathroom where you'd expect valuable jewelry or whatever to be found. Plus, it's harder to escape from the second floor. My poor friend felt so much guilt for convincing his dad to let him go out. It wasn't his fault. Any other day, it would have been fine. When I was around 11, I also had someone enter the house, except this was while I was sleeping. My mom had gone out for the evening and left me, my sister, and my brother home. My sister was 13 and my brother 9. We were used to staying home. We also lived on the main road, so there wasn't much to fear. But I remember hearing a car roll into the driveway and I raced into bed from the living room, was watching TV when I should have been sleeping. Then a man walked into the house and into my room, lit a cigarette and stood over me as I pretended to sleep. I thought it was my mom at first, but I squinted and saw it wasn't her at all, but some dude I had never seen in my life. The next morning, I found his burnt out cigarette in the bird seed. For years, I've tried to understand what the hell happened. Mom says she has no idea who it was and swears it wasn't one of her friends, but I'm just not sure. The guy didn't break anything to get inside, and I heard the car pull into the driveway. No one would just park in our driveway if they didn't know us. Embarrassed to say, I still have nightmares of this 25 years on and wake up screaming that there's a man standing over me. I don't think I'll ever know what happened that night or who that man was. Well, if I'm gonna get any sleep tonight, I'm gonna need a few pills. Story 9 
Tough to pick just one, because there is true evil in humanity out there. Stuff like the Blood Eagle ritual is pretty awful. But in terms of really scary, probably stuff that just kind of happens by accident, like the story of Kyle Plush, just awful. He was in a minivan that just had one of those back seats that you can push backwards to lay flat in the trunk for extra storage space. He went to grab something in the trunk, leaning over the seat, and it tipped backwards and pinned him, upside down against the back of the car, in a position such that he couldn't get himself out. He called the police twice. The second time he called and gave them a very clear description of the car. Plush called 911 again at around 3.35 p.m. Police said this time he provided a description of the vehicle as he desperately pleaded for help but couldn't hear the dispatcher. Isaac said the information didn't get relayed to officers at the scene. This is not a joke, the teen said over 911. I'm almost dead. He asked the dispatcher to tell my mom I love her if I die. Just a horrible random incident that could have happened to anybody. This kid didn't go looking for trouble, like he didn't try to go down a chimney or go caving like other people who have gotten stuck in suffocated. He was just reaching for something in his trunk, got pinned, and then was not found in time. Nightmarish for the kid and his family. I don't get it either. I'm glad they filed a lawsuit. The fact that the 911 dispatcher didn't relay info about the vehicle to the police who were on the scene is what killed that boy. They were there, searching, and he gave them a description of the vehicle as he was dying. For whatever reason, she claimed her computer was frozen, but then why did she take the call? The dispatcher opted not to tell the police because I guess the kid wasn't actually answering questions. This makes sense because it was an emergency situation where the kid couldn't hear his phone. While looking for articles, I saw one saying that the dispatcher had been put on leave but was allowed to return to work. Absolutely disgraceful. God help anyone else who calls and ends up getting her because apparently she gets to choose what she does or does not relay to the police. I don't regret many things in my life, but I regret this one deeply. I was leaving work in 2001, I believe, so while cell phones were common, not everyone had them. I worked in a small office building. You know those kinds that rent out spaces to several small businesses? I had stayed up late that day. The only reason I feel as bad as I do, as I was leaving, I was the only other car in the lot. I noticed the property manager, an elderly lady, and a very sweet lady getting out of her car next to the dumpster holding a bag of trash. I drove past her, turned the corner, and went home. This was on Friday night. Come to find out, she didn't put her car in park. I got the news that she was pinned between the dumpster and her car until found on Sunday. Our dumpster was not visible from any main road. Had I been 30 seconds later in leaving, I would have seen it happen. Being elderly, the low impact still pinned her and broke some bones. Even though she was found alive, she didn't make it to the hospital. I don't know if I had seen it happen. I would have been able to react fast enough to warn her, jump out, and push the car. It wasn't accelerating, just slowly rolling in neutral. Or if I had, would have even been able to call 911 and her injuries treatable after not being outside for two days. And I can't imagine her mindset. We were in a commercial area. No real reason for anyone to be immediately within earshot if she called for help, which I'm sure she did many times. I can't imagine the pain this guy must have been through. Story 10. There was a woman who worked in a science lab who spilled two drops of organic mercury on the back of her gloved hand. Those two drops destroyed her entire nervous system and brain. The mercury story always scares the crap out of me because I used to work in a lab and we had a compound that could go through gloves. I read the materials safety data sheet before I handled the compound, something you're always supposed to do, and it warned that proper personal protective equipment should be worn and that the compound was a horrible toxic carcinogen. Not knowing that it could go through gloves, Gloves, none of us did, we began handling it. I got some on my palm and continued working. It only took like five seconds for my hand to feel warm and strange, so I removed the glove and there was a large splotch on my left palm. I immediately went to wash up, scared for my life. It went through my skin immediately, and it also targeted the nervous system, but I ended up being fine due to minimal exposure. I can't remember what compound it was now because it was so long ago, but it had a lot of P words. Scary, scary stuff. There's nothing scarier than working in a lab and knowing you're doing everything right just to have it all go wrong. There are a lot of terrifying lab stories we had to listen to as graduate students in our safety class. Someone splashed hydrochloric acid in her eye 
eye while wearing contacts, which retained the acid and burned the contact to her eye. The eye wash didn't work because the contact was already burned and stuck on. She was wearing safety glasses. Lesson, don't wear contacts in a lab. Someone got her long hair stuck in some sort of press while working alone at night and it wrapped up her hair and eventually crushed her skull. Lesson, don't work alone in the lab and keep your hair pulled back. Images of compressed gas cylinders breaking through brick walls after falling and breaking off their valves. Lesson, secure the gas canisters all the time. Images of centrifuges rotator axle failing and again going through brick walls. Lesson, proper equipment maintenance. Tert butylithium, highly pyrophoric compound. Any exposure to air causes ignition, was being used by someone not trained in its use or safety. It exploded and she died. Lesson, know the compounds you're using and safety measures you should be taking. Long story short, don't mess around with chemicals. Story 11. I'll tell you one that happened to me, or rather was witness to. One night, I was out at a bar with a friend that I was visiting in New Rochelle, New York. We went outside for a cigarette and a car came flying past the bar. The car burned through a red light and started going up this hill that was on a curve. We watched as he veered over the double yellow and smashed head on with another car coming up from the other direction. Both cars hind ends lifted up then slammed down. The car that was driving correctly burst into flames. I ran inside and grabbed the fire extinguisher then yelled to the bartender to call 911 and say there's been an accident. My friend, a few other patrons, and I ran to the cars. Now I used to think this was a fictional trope, but I was pretty drunk before this happened and I swear it sobered me up instantly. I tried spraying the fire, but it did nothing. The fumes and heat were awful and all we could do was stand back. The worst part was, and this will haunt me forever, was that the woman in the burning car was screaming as she died. My god, it was the worst sound ever. The fire department came and put the fire out. The police took us back to the bar and took statements. I found out the next day in the news that the car that was not speeding was being driven by a young woman coming home late from work. She was a block away from home and I think she was either newly married or a new mother. The rotten guy driving the other car was some rich drunk cocksucker. He lost a leg but otherwise was physically unharmed. I have no clue if he did time as I left to go back home a day or so later. I'm trying to find a link for the news story, but I can't, as this was maybe six or seven years back. I remember it being reported on Low HUD and Channel 12 News. I think what's more scary than this is that stories like this are a dime a dozen. Story 12 Years ago, my now husband worked for an industrial laundry company in their head office when a PR disaster happened that also mentally screwed up a number of people. Their company collected laundry from a large hospital and medical type businesses, e.g. care homes, etc., and cleaned them. You can imagine the sort of heavy duty cleaning, bleaching and boiling, etc. needed to remove these sorts of biological contaminants. One day, a laundry cart went through the usual bleaching and boiling cycle before it dropped out onto a conveyor belt to be sorted for drying, pressing, when there was a horrid scream. A small newborn baby's body had been discovered tangled up amongst the sheets. It had been cooked. The laundry workers were distraught. The whole place had to be shut down. The police called and the laundry was tracked back to the hospital to discover what happened. It turns out a, thankfully in some ways, stillborn baby had been left in the cot waiting to be taken down to the hospital mortuary after the parents had said their goodbyes and covered it with a blanket. But somehow, one of the nurses hadn't realized. Just on shift was the best guess, so just grabbed up all the linen out of the cot and off the bed in the delivery room with the body bundled inside and emptied it into the laundry hamper slash trolley thing. The other nurses and parents assumed the baby had been collected by the mortuary to be stored awaiting their funeral decision. The laundry was found not to be to blame, but the parents were devastated and the hospital took a lot of flack. The poor laundry workers who discovered the body ended up being given counseling before eventually quitting. The laundry did amend its practice to individually emptying each laundry hamper into the industrial machines instead of just tipping them in to stop anything like that from happening again. I could never work there again. Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these that you would like to share with us, please leave it in the comments below. If you do choose to share, please remember to mark any necessary trigger warnings as you never know what a reader has gone through. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time!